Damn, here we go then. What is on in and around the Wrexham area this uh, this coming weeks? Uh, well, you could do a lot worse, girls and boys, than getting yourself up to Theatre Cluid this very evening as this production is about to close in Moles and uh, is going on a massive UK tour. It's called Bang Bang. It's a brand new piece by the fantastic John Cleese. Incredibly, it is his first outing as a stage writer. Uh, in fact, I'm going to let John Cleese tell you all about it. Hang on a sec. I'm John Cleese. You may know me from Monty Python and Towers. I have adapted a wonderful farce. And if you like my stuff, usually I can guarantee you that you'll have some good laughs if you come and see Bang Bang. Now, I've also got to say, book tickets today at your box office or by clicking the link in this post. What does that mean? <laughs> there you go, John Cleese. So there you go then, uh, Bang Bang is up at Theatre Clue, it's been there since Wednesday and uh, closes today, there's two productions today, 2.30 and 7.30, I shall tell you how to get all your tickets and whatnot after we hear from the stars of the piece. Now, it stars this one, uh, Tessa Peake Jones, uh, you may not remember, know her by the name, but you'll certainly know her by the if I tell you that she played Raquel in Only Fools and Horses, uh, Del Boy's wife. Uh, Wendy Peters, who is uh, famous, of course, for Coronation Street, played uh, Scylla Battersby. And Tony Gardner. And we're going to hear from Tony first, right? Tony is an English-born actor and a qualified doctor. And combining the two in the 1990s, forming the multi-award-winning comedy duo uh, Struck Off and Die with fellow comic and doctor Phil Hammond. Tony is uh, probably uh, best known for playing Brian Johnson in Children ITV's My Parents Are Aliens. The kids will know him. The kids will know him. And um, playing John in the critically acclaimed Last Tango in Halifax, which uh, gets its fifth series starting tomorrow at Sunday on BBC One, 9pm. I caught a word with Tony and uh, Tessa and Wendy on Wednesday. And uh, here's Tony, who is appearing in the UK tour of John Cleese's Bang Bang up at Theatre Cluid. Here he is on the stage and screen show, Cal on FM. You'll like this. So, I mean, the tour's only just started. I was going to ask you about life on the road. Is it, uh, it are, are you a good tourer? Do you enjoy it? Yeah, I do enjoy it. Now we're up and running, you know, because you get into a rhythm of it. So it's, it's just nice. You just... You know, pitch up on the Tuesday and, and, and work till the Saturday and then you're off and, and as you come off stage on Saturday night, all the crew there waiting to take off the stage and take off the set and put it, in, you know, they work until about three o'clock in the morning and then, you know, then they're all off up to the next venue and uh, it all starts again the next week and it's a new venue and a new energy and a new audience and different audiences over the country. It's great and it's bringing theatre to the regions, which is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's been a, I mean, we'll talk about it in, in a little bit in a minute, but uh, this the Bang Bang, John Cleese's brand new play, I mean, there's been a lot of fuss about it before you've turned up, so um, good. I'm not surprised that you've got uh, good audiences. Uh, but just about yourself, I mean, I, I, I was just reading earlier that uh, I, I'm always intrigued about what people used to do before they took up acting, and uh, in a game of top trumps, I think you, you'd score quite highly in this, that you were a qualified doctor, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I qualified in 87 and then um 1990 for i went up with another doctor friend to edinburgh and did a a, a comedy duo called struck off and die and we we um we that's how i got into acting and i got a, an agent and we were up there for five years and did very well and did a couple of series on radio four and got an agent and um i carried on training to be a gp and and ended up sort of working as a locum GP in between acting jobs but um, because I married a doctor it enabled me to <laughs> that it, you know it's a joint decision for me to sort of stop doing general practice and, and just concentrate on 
on acting full time, and that's what I've done since the year 2000. Really, I haven't been a doctor since 2000. I haven't worked as a doctor since 2000. It's a weird way in, but you know, I I, I loved being a doctor. I, 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 it defines me. It's who I am. You know, it's just yeah. all my friends are doctors, and I, I I had a ball. I really enjoyed it, and then I just fell into something else that I enjoy just as much. So Phil Hammond, who you did the uh, the brilliantly titled "Struck Off and Die," it's excellent, <laughs> excellent name. Um, he was a, he was a doctor as well, right? Phil, yeah, yeah, he still is, and um, he still writes for Private Eye and uh, appears on Countdown and Have I Got News for You and things, and still still put, takes shows to Edinburgh and around the country, talking about the health service and medicine, and uh, yeah, yeah, he's still doing great stuff as a stand-up. He was a brilliant stand-up. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. And is it like having a title? You, if you're a doctor, are you always a doctor? Um, that's a really interesting point, actually, because <laughs> <laughs> it's only a courtesy title anyway, for, many, for, for the various reasons. You could only... If, if you're called doctor, you should have a doctorate, like a PhD. And, yeah. and initially, medical degrees came from only Oxford and Cambridge, and they were doctorates, so that's why we're called doctor. But in actual fact, we're not doctors. Our, my degree is a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery, and so as courtesy, we're just called doctors. Um, and so uh, it's still on my bank cards and things. And sometimes I'm thinking, if I was a doc, if I had a PhD, I'd probably be more um, strict about saying yes, no, I am doctor. But I, yeah. I don't really correct people anymore. I did for a bit because it just sounded weird being called Mister. But yeah. like I said, it's still on my bank cards. And uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's strange, really. It's uh, yeah, it's just a hangover from those days. Yeah, <laughs> very proud of it, but I think probably just a bit. Yeah, especially on if it's on your passport, you'll get all sorts of trouble on planes, won't you? Oh well, I've had that, yeah. But oh, have you? Well, uh, yeah. I just, I still, you, you can't really say no. I'm not medically qualified. Or by the time I get to anyone who's collapsed on a plane, there's always about three doctors and a couple of nurses and a physio there. So yeah, I let them get on with it. Absolutely, they'll, they'll be in bad, bad way if it's just the ex doctor who's now an actor on the, on the stage comes and sees. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, quite a few comedians have just done done just that, haven't they? Like Harry Hill and Paul Paul Sinner from the uh, from the Chase, and Stephen yeah, K. Yeah. Amos as well. They're... There's a few. I think people are more likely to remember them. Harry Hill qualified the same year as I did from George's. Oh right. Um, and but I was guys. But um, yeah, so we sort of knew him up in Edinburgh from the early days. Um, but he, he he didn't sort of stay in it as long as I did. But yeah, there, there are lots. I think people just tend to. Well, I think there's various reasons. I think people tend to remember them it's quite an interesting story but yeah. I, just, yeah, I suppose people who go to med school tend to be polymaths and quite good at you know drama and things they do lots of things and so the opportunities arise that you can do you know the reviews that we used to put on were just great I mean we had so much fun there's such great talent there people who could play musical instruments and stuff because they'd all gone to good schools and were good at learning things so and I've got to ask you about my parents are aliens because my I'd, I'd say I said to my kids who were all grown up now I said um do you remember the programme called My Parents Are Aliens? And they all went, yeah, it's brilliant! And when I, I, mean, I, went, I did a bit of research on it and I thought, I can remember them watching this thing. Are you, I mean, it seems a bit strange to be, after all the work that you've done, to be remembered for, uh, well, one of the biggest programmes on children's ITV, My Parents Are Aliens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I don't moan at all. I, I get recognised every day for that and I'm recognised more for that than anything else because, you know, it, not just because it was on for seven or eight years and we did 105 episodes, but these, these kids grew up with it. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's very much part of their childhood and, and it was written specifically for them using their voices set in their countries you know it's sort of it was an important show and um the, the kids who are now in their 30s uh, at music festivals when i go and <laughs> and out in the street and at exeter university i just get recognized every day and it's always a delight because they're unconditional about it it's just it makes their day just to bump into me so i can't complain about that no, absolutely no. but you did you write it as well is that right uh, i wrote a couple of episodes yeah yeah just a couple but um yeah, it, so I know hard work that went into creating each episode because they all had three storylines and each one of them had to have a bit of a moral about bullying or shoplifting or something like that. So it wasn't just thrown together. It was, like I say, made for them and and um, it's better for them to watch stuff that's made for them than to go and watch EastEnders and things, which they, you know, not knocking EastEnders, but I don't think children should be watching it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's their introduction into drama and, and story and uh, it's still good that the BBC still make um, children's telly and I think ITV hopefully will start remaking it. Yeah. Stop making it. Um, 
back in 1990, uh, 2006. Right. I'm looking as well on your CV. I mean, some of the some of the work that you've done. I mean, you can you can die a happy man. I mean, Armstrong and Miller, Tracy Ullman Show, Lenny Henry Show, Lead Balloon and Fresh Meat. All these all these comedies. Are you? Is that is that? Do you think is that where your uh, your heart lies in comedy? No, it's where the um, the money lies. <laughs> <laughs> cynical but yeah. just you know majority of actors me included you just go where the next job is absolutely so it happens that it's been comedy and uh, i've done one drama which is um last tango in halifax which starts on sunday but uh the fifth series of that and um it's a drama but it's probably one of the funniest roles i've ever had so yeah know, it's uh, it's pretty much the same thing you perhaps you think the same way writing it and uh, and performing it as well but yeah it's uh, i'm very lucky to have been involved in lots of shows that were long running and that's not through me, that's just luck, you know, I just happened to be put in shows that went to four or five series, and um, that's one, shows it's a good show, and two, then the writers then write for you and write with your voice, and so you end up looking better and better as the series go on. And which leads us beautifully on to uh, this Bang Bang tour you're doing. It's John Cleese's first stage writing debut, which seems to me to be incredible, really. Um, that in itself must be a thrill for you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's a Fado farce. Georges Fado um, was a, an 18th century French writer and uh, he wrote lots of farces. And um, uh, John Cleese has uh, written a version of it, but it's still very much Fado and plotted by Fado. And then and John's written sort of uh, just used a translation and, and has written it um, very much with his voice. And uh, it's it's well, it's it's yeah, it's been amazing to meet him because I mean I grew up knowing every Monty Python sketch inside out, back to front. I yeah. have all the records and watched it on TV and um, was a huge fan and to get to meet him he's been in the rehearsal room and he's, we've met him quite a few times and he's helped us out on the stage and uh, yeah it's been great and he's coming again a few times I think as well so yeah that's been a, a pleasure what a delight to, yeah. uh, to work with John Cleese. Well I can imagine because I mean I've, I've often said in, in, in the acting world every now and again you just get slapped upside the head by something and to be able to work with somebody like him is uh, it, I mean, it must be incredible really. Yeah it's great honor honestly it, it is a great honor and I, 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 um you'd be the same as me it sounds i was uh yeah rather um very very pleased to to have this opportunity yeah it's great so was he involved pretty much with the creative processes as well as the writing it um yeah yeah he's been in the rehearsal room and uh he's watched us dress rehearsals he came to those and, and well rehearsals dress rehearsals and he sometimes would give us workshops to take us through scenes and, and he gave us lots of notes about how to land jokes and how to say maybe you should look that way then say it and uh, and then edited it and yeah so that's I love that side of comedy you know it's an ongoing process we're, we're you know we're still finding out how to work each line and get the best laughs and and what the audience likes and um, yeah it's uh, it's a great process and and, and to, to have the master telling us yeah how to how to perform farce is um, is fantastic yeah. and, and you know the snobbery about farce oh I don't like farce people would say no I don't like that sort of thing well you know 40 towers were 12 farces yeah um, people don't realize that that's what farce is and uh, you know uh, you can't you can't learn from uh, a greater exponent of the genre than Jean Cleese absolutely Jean Cleese I called him gosh I made him French Jean Cleese <laughs> Uh, yeah, is it just the three of you doing it? No, no, there's nine of us in the cast. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've also got um, Andy Seacom, um, who is Harry, his, that's an interesting thing, Andy Seacom is Harry Seacom's son. So oh, right. We're working with a python and a child of a goon. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Tony, it's been an absolute treat to speak to you, mate. Thanks ever so much for that. OK, no worries at all. Great stuff. Cheers. All right, cheers. Thanks a lot. So there you go, Mr Tony Gardner, who is appearing in this Bang Bang up at Theatre Cluet at this present time. And also as well... In this, uh, there is uh, Tessa Peak Jones. Now then, brace yourselves. Tessa is also an English-born actress, and uh, she is almost definitely best known for playing the iconic role of Raquel in the awesome Only Fools and Horses, and she played the role for an incredible 15 years. Other, more, other notable TV appearances include The Demon Headmaster, Midsummer Murders, Casualty, Holby City, and Doctor Who. And at the moment, she also 
also is appearing in John Cleese's Bang Bang at the present time up at Theatre Cluid. And I had a chat with her as well on Wednesday. And I started by asking her about life on the road. Here she is, the wonderful Tessa Peake Jones on the stage and the screen show. Hello, Andy. Hi, Tessa. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Marvellous. Thanks ever so much for chatting with us. I really appreciate it. I mean, it's a huge tour, this, isn't it? Yeah, it's quite it's quite a long time and quite a lot of different places in the country we're going to, but that's nice. I like that because, you you know, every every town is different, every audience is different. Yeah. It's nice, and you get to know bits of England that... I mean, I've never been to Mould, for example, so, you know, these are lovely firsts as well, which is nice. It is hard work, of course it is, but, yeah. but it is nice. I think, I think to get the chance to be paid to go around different places and... Just get to know those towns is is a real luxury, isn't it? And do you kind of do you like to do the touristy things when you're out and about? Uh, well, if there's time, I mean, um, we haven't up to now because we've just been getting the play on. But this is our first week where we've actually now we've got no rehearsals. We're just unless you're an understudy, they're rehearsing today. But um, you know, we're just able to play the eight shows, so that's quite nice. So I've had a little look around the market today in Mould in the town centre. Lovely. Um, yeah, and I might go on a trip on Friday. Yeah, it's 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 very nice to have at least two days a week now where we can explore yeah and and, and do you find especially with doing a comedy i suppose we do, do do different responses really from different audiences yeah it's quite interesting because last night was our first night here in wales and we've been in exeter for 10 shows or 12 shows um how different actually they were last night here in wales to exeter and you think well why would that be i mean comedy is comedy but i guess you know last night they picked up on things that in exeter they didn't find funny and in other bits where we expected more laughter we didn't get as much so it it's a very peculiar thing i don't think there's in fact john cleese said on on the saturday the last saturday we were there he'd watched several shows and he said after the saturday evening one he said well now last night friday night they were completely different i said yeah why is that john and he said, I honestly don't know. <laughs> and I said, but you're the comedy legend. You're meant to have all the answers. Yeah. And he said, I really do not know. And it is, it's really weird. And I suppose that a group of people, a bit like you'd have in a tube train or a bus, they take on a sort of personality as a group, don't they? Yeah. They become a personality. So it might be that there are certain dominating features in one audience one night where people perhaps laugh very loudly and that encourages them. You know, so they take on and others, they might be slightly more inhibited so that affects other people. I don't know what it is. It's, it's, I think it's an unsolvable thing and I think it no, you're noticing it much more because it's comedy. I guess with a, with a play where you're not re- relying on laughs, you know, audiences are, of course, still different, but you're not as aware of it because of the journey they go on with you. But because it's comedy, you're sort of waiting for their approval. Yeah, absolutely. So you notice it more, I guess. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, uh, well, I mean, we'll talk about it a bit, bit more in a minute, but uh, you're obviously best known for playing Rack Ellie and Only Fools and Horses, but doing something like this on the road in live in theatres, do, do you think people expect comedy from you? I honestly don't know. I mean, um, I haven't actually done any. This is the first sort of comedy play I've done for years and years and years. The theatre I've done recently has been quite sort of serious. But so and I, that's why I was partly interested in doing this job because I've never played a farce before, and I thought actually that's something. It's a good discipline to learn that. Um, but I suppose they do expect that, yeah, because yeah, I suppose they do. I don't know, but yeah, I imagine they probably think I would fit in more easily to comedy than anything else because that's what they're familiar with. Yeah, and what what is the what is the story about this bang bang? Well, it's it's sort of I, I think it's got all the ingredients I believe that a farce should have. It's got mistaken identities, it's got um, uh, attempts at adultery on various levels between a husband and a wife. It's got what seems to be complete requirement every time, which is three pairs of trousers which come off the men. <laughs> Perfect. That seems to be part of it. I went to see um, the play, the bank robbery that goes wrong. Uh, in London before I started this job because I read it was a farce and I thought it'd be quite good to sit in an audience and see what a farce is like. Yeah. And that had three pairs of trousers <laughs> came off the men. <laughs> it also had a lot of doors and it had a lot of mistaken identity and I thought, well, isn't that strange? It's obviously part of a requirement of a farce. So this is really the story of a couple. They're married, they've been married years. They're slightly bored with each other but they're sort of hanging on in there. He is, I suspect, having been having quite a few affairs. She is being persuaded that he's being adulterous so she then says well if he's going to be i'm going to be and so it's a story about how they both end up in the same uh block of apartments both trying to have illicit meetups 
on the same night, and that's where the chaos comes in with the balconies and the doors and the various comings and goings. And then the final act shows retribution for both or one or other of them and, yeah, watches that marriage and whether it's going to survive or not. So it's quite, I think it's quite good. For, I don't know, I haven't watched it, but it's good fun to play. And from the people we talked to who've seen it, it's quite good fun to watch. It looks quite classical. Is that is that fair? Yeah, it's very much set in its time. It's 1890s, set very, very period. Costumes are all completely period. Weeks. Yep. The set is beautiful. It's got we've got two sets. One changes in the in the middle of the first half of the play, so it's all very traditional, which you know I think is is lovely to be faithful to the piece of Fado. Um, I'm not sure whether we were saying the other night, you know, whether youngsters, anyone under sort of 30, I don't know if they'll come. I hope they will, but whether they'll go, oh no, is it one of those like a history lesson? You know, and hopefully <laughs> they'll realise. We had a few young young ones in last night who said, oh, they thought it was going to be sort of quite boring, and then they actually loved it because they realised it was just about chasing around on stage and everyone being silly and pratfalls and stupidity. Yeah. Stupidity. So they actually quite enjoyed it. But whether that would put youngsters off just seeing a traditional set and period costumes, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you're saying that. I mean, looking at your uh, your, your CV, I mean, it's such an extensive uh, amount of work that you've done. Uh, do, you, do you find, what happened on theatre for a while, um, do you find it like a nerve-wracking? Do you get nervous doing it? I don't, I mean, yeah, everyone gets anxious every night, I think, because you just want to get it right. Uh -huh. I don't think that ever leaves you. But I've been doing quite a lot of theatre recently, but I stopped, because of my kids, I stopped for 10 years. And when I went back to it, this was quite a few years ago, not 10 years ago, uh, I chose to do Shirley Valentine, which is a one-woman show on your own for two hours, cooking an entire egg chips and ham on stage oh. and talking to an audience for two hours. And I thought on the first preview of that, why have you done this? You're, <laughs> you're 10 years off. You come back. There's no one on the stage with you. Yeah. It's an incredibly lonely process. I don't think I'll ever do it again. But I wanted to sort of challenge myself. But it was quite terrifying because you thought, if anything goes wrong, I can't even look at anyone else on the stage. It's just you. You know, and doing this blimming and making the chips from peeling the potato right. And I've never cooked chips in my life. I'm now an expert, of course, because I have to do it every night. But it's really challenging. So... But, of course, you always still do get nervous because you want it to go right, you know, and you want to do the best for that audience that night. So I don't think that ever... I don't think actors ever get complacent, do they? I think they're always sort of slightly, not necessarily nervous, but just aware that they want to do it to the best of their ability. I think you only you only get nervous when, when you care about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And I think there's a... I don't know, there's a sort of... People say, you know, well, what's the difference? Which do you prefer, telly or, or theatre? And I think that's the main difference is there's that sort of what, what you could call nerves or thrill or excitement or whatever that you get from wanting to get it absolutely right because there's an audience out there and you can't go back. Uh, and you don't ever quite get that sort of nerves when you're doing takes on telly because... Yeah you know you can stop and go back. So there's always a slight get-out clause, isn't there, when you're doing filming, whereas the theatre, there's no get-out, really. You just have to sort of rely on each other. And, yeah. Well, and in cases where this has gone wrong, which sometimes it has already, uh, you need Tony Gardner to talk to the audience and bring them in on it, and it's brilliant, because then they hoot with laughter and give him a round. <laughs> so bring Tony on tour everywhere you go, is all I can say, and every play you do from now on, because he's great. He's just got a natural facility of being able to chat to the audience, which most of us would die yeah. rather than do that. But he's got this fantastic way of just being able to go, oopsie, look what just happened, the door fell off. And, it's <laughs> and of course they love it, it's brilliant. <laughs> Wonderful. And that kind of leads us brilliantly on to, uh, I, I need to ask you about Only Fools and Horses, because mm. it, it, I suppose for many actors... You can't really claim to have done something that's iconic or, or classical, uh, a classic, I should say. Um, uh, and you've and you've just you've done that. So when, after you've done something like that, do you kind of think, sort of professionally, I can die happy now, or was it just a job that just happened to be really big? I think it's. I, I feel incredibly privileged to have been part of it. I didn't realise I'd never seen the program when I went into it, so I was a complete novice. And when I walked in and they said, your life will change, and you won't be able to travel on a tube, I thought, what on earth are they? I've done telly before, mates. You know, what is the difference? And had no idea that, you know, up to 24 million people were going to watch it every time it was on. Yeah. And, of course, it did indeed change everything. But, yeah, so I feel incredibly privileged to have learnt from those guys, to have been on that journey with them where, where the audience and the public so, so took it to their hearts. 
you know, yeah, you can die happy because you think, actually, you know, it's something other people don't get that opportunity to have. I was incredibly lucky, uh, unaware of probably quite how lucky I was to get it. But, yeah, it's been, it's been lovely. I mean, today still we all talk when we meet up. You know, people every single day come up to us and say how much they enjoy it. Yeah. Well, to, to have a job that started 20, whatever, 30 years ago and have people still coming up and saying to you each day, congratulations, it really gives us pleasure in our house, is, I can't tell you, it's the most amazing thing in the world because, you know, other people in other jobs that are doing far more serious things like saving lives, they don't get patted on the back when they do things well, whereas we do. And it's, uh, I mean, I never forget that either. I think that as, as well is an in incredible honour to, to have people being able to come up and give feedback, you know, which, which is just lovely. Yeah. And every time, every time there was a, 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 a like a Christmas special or anything, it was always a surefire hit. Um, and to be involved in something that is, you know, it's going to be a hit regardless of of anything, really. I mean, that must be just a lovely feeling. Well, it's amazing because I suppose part of the reason of its success was that when the um, Christmas specials came up each year, with you know, John would present the script and then we'd do a read through. I suppose part of maybe why it was so successful is that it was never taken for granted. We'd do a reading, and then everyone around the table, mainly David and Nick, of course, and John, would say, right, how are we going to make the best that we can of this? And then they'd spend the next three or four weeks, literally, the public would never believe it, rehearsing, particularly David and Nick, rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing, the minutest detail uh -huh. of something that would then, when you saw it with a studio audience, give huge dividends in terms of the laughter. But if people knew the work that had gone into really making it the most perfect that they could, they'd be quite staggered. And I think it was their genuine commitment to making it the best ever and never sitting back. They always said, no, no, we can do better than that. Come on, let's rehearse it again. No, no, we can do, you know, always learning and wanting to push it slightly further. I think that's the reason perhaps it was alive for as long as it was and the feedback was so good. And it was already a hit, obviously, by, by the time you joined. So was you apprehensive about taking on the role? Well, I wasn't because I'd never seen it, so I didn't know it was a hit. I mean, for me, it was I read the script. Uh, it was comedy on telly, which I'd never done, not with an audience. So I said to my agent, I'd really like to have that experience. Um, and, and I didn't know about their relationship. I didn't know anything about the programme. So I read it and thought, what an amazing character this is. She's somebody who's a sort of failed actress who's going to meet this rather sad man at an internet agency, you know, not internet, but dating agency. Yeah. Uh, she's quite lonely. And I just saw her as a character and thought, wow, that's a really nice thing to play. And, of course, when I went into it, it was a one, you know, I think it was a 70-minute special and no speak at all about it becoming a regular character she was this was just a one-off and i think if they'd said then oh you're going to be connected with this for the next 20 years of your life i'd probably have said no <laughs> but of course you go oh no no i don't want that part of the reason i want to be actor is i don't want to know what comes next so i did it just accepting it on what i felt was like a little bbc film and i thought it was so brilliantly written and so sympathetically written for a woman um and it was only when I actually joined the cast and we started rehearsing it, I realised sort of, and people, their reaction was, oh my God, you're in that programme. I started to think, oh, perhaps I better watch a bit of this because it's obviously, you know, yeah. a bit more than I have thought about. Uh, so it was quite a shock, really. <laughs> the whole, and then about six months later, they phoned and said, listen, we think John would really like to bring her in and have her as a regular, as a, you know, to play against David's character. How do you feel? But again, then, you know, as usual, it's only every year, you know, you sort of play the next job. And so it was just going to be the one series. Yeah. So it was, yeah, fine. And then, oh, well, there's a Christmas one now. Oh, well, OK. And before you know it, you know, you've done 20 years down the line and you're part of a team and a family and you can't imagine your life without them. And incredibly, I, d I didn't realise this, that uh, the reason why John Sullivan brought you in is because there was no women in it. Well, there was Sue Holderness, Rack um, Marlene. She'd been in it from the beginning. Oh, right. That, yes, yeah. So she was in it, but I think it was male-heavy. I mean, all the other characters were these very rich sort of Cockney men. And I think John just felt it needed more of a balance, yeah, which is why he brought, I think, first um, uh, myself and then uh, Gwyneth Cassandra in to yeah. just, just rebalance it a bit. Yeah. I think that was wise, too, because I think audiences, of course, had loved it up to then, but I think it introduced more, a, a different sort of audience having women in it as well, you know. That, that, that's brilliant, uh, Tessa. I, I really appreciate that, and uh, I, I wish you all the best with, you, with your run at Theatre Clue and this massive tour to the UK. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you've been lovely to chat to. Lovely. Thanks ever so much for that. And, all right. Uh, we shall, uh, I'll, I'll try and get up there, although tickets seem to be uh, going like hot.
hotcakes. Well, I'm sure they'll get you one, so don't worry about that. If you can make it, that'd be brilliant. Perfect. If I if I end up there, I shall um, I shall come, come and see us. Come yeah, and say hello. Come and say hi. Brilliant. Cheers, Tessa. Really appreciate right. it. Take care. Cheers. Bye. So there you go, that is uh, Tessa Pete Jones giving us an incredible insight into backstage in Only Fools and Horses. Absolutely brilliant, that. So there we go, that's uh, Tessa Pete Jones and Tony Gardner, and now by no means least, last but no, by, by no means least, uh, we have got Miss uh, Wendy Peters. Wendy Peters is, uh, well, she has worked extensively on stage and screen since leaving drama school back in 1987 and uh, becoming well known possibly by uh, now the now legendary Stella Battersby in Coronation Street. An incredibly vast and varied career, most recently seeing her play uh, the part of Mrs Baskin in the West End musical Big with Matthew Kelly and Kimberly Walsh and Jane McGuinness. Now, of course, she is touring the country in this brand new French farce, Bang Bang, uh, which is going down so well with North Wales audiences. Closes tonight in Mould. I shall give you the details on how you can get tickets straight after we hear from the brilliant Wendy Peters, a.k.a. Scylla Battersby. Here we go. When I was in drama school, I always used to think that touring sounded like an amazing thing to do. Is, is, it, uh, is it... Are you cut out for that? I love the fact that we get to bring a show to a different audience every week because that keeps it fresh. You get different reactions, different stages, different sides of auditorium. So that keeps the actual show fresh. And it's lovely travelling around. I mean, I now know most of the motorway system in the country and, and most of the theatre venues, most of the town. So yeah. you know, there's not many places now that I haven't been to. And, and, I, and I read somewhere earlier that uh, I know you've had a, a, a really varied career, but uh, mm. uh, when, when you left left uh, drama school. Theatre was your passion, right? Completely. Absolutely. When I was little, I used to watch all the classic movie musicals, you know, Singing in the Rain, On the Town, Easter Parade, all those, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to sing and I wanted to dance, and my mum took me to the theatre a lot in Manchester, because I was born near um, Blackburn Clitheroe in, in Lancashire, so Manchester was our big sort of place to go and see things. And my mum very luckily took my, me and my sister to see a lot of musicals there, and that's when I fell in love with, with stage really and want, wanting to do it as a career and i mean we'll talk about it in in in, in a mo but obviously you uh, you're best known for playing Scylla Battersby in coronation street so yeah. when when you go into a musical do people kind of go oh i didn't realize you could sing is that someone, someone actually said that to me last thursday evening in exit <laughs> yeah. yeah i went came into the bar at the end and they did that oh wow, we realized it was you and blimey we didn't know you could sing <laughs> I was going to ask you about that actually, because oh. there, there seems to be a um, there's an excitement when somebody who's been on TV, well known for something on the TV, turns up at a local theatre doing uh, doing a piece. I mean that brings people in, and there's and there is a buzz about that. Are you aware of that? Well, a little bit, yeah. I mean, it is lovely. I mean, you know, there were people in last night um, that you know came bounding over and wanted program kind of and talked about Corey and all that kind of stuff, and and and, it, and if myself or Tess from Fools and Horses in Grantchester or Tony from Parents of Aliens and Last Tango, if we can bring a few people in each night that don't normally come to theatre, hopefully it means they will come back and see something else when somebody else in it that they recognise. Yes. Because, you know, we've got to keep these the theatre audiences coming because it, it's such an important part of our entertainment system. And this is a... This is a um, I mean, as you say, this is a stellar cast, isn't it? I mean, it's... Uh... Yeah. Just, just, I mean, just, just, I, I, I thought it was only the three of you, and, and Tony was saying that there's nine of you. Yeah, and they're all absolutely brilliant. It's a real team piece. Um, because, you know, Fast is so mechanical and has, in a way, in a way, almost like a musical, because it is bits of it are choreographed when it comes to doors and wardrobes and trousers, and we've got it all in there. Yeah. Um, it, it, it has to be timed so perfectly. 
Um, and, and we have a brilliant, brilliant team. Everybody is so funny in it. Fantastic. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a funny old thing, because I, I, was, I was thinking about, uh, about John Cleese. It's, it's his first outing as a, a, a theatre uh, writer, yeah. which I, I found that yeah. aston- astonishing, actually. You know, if people are coming to see it, they will see a little bit of faulty powers in there, character-wise and possibly um, story-wise. Um, but, um, but only a tiny, tiny bit. But I think, because I think with everything, if you're in something or you're writing something, there will be a little bit of you that leaks into it. Uh, and, and I think, you know, there's certain, I think certainly possibly in Tony's character, there's a little bit of, of, of basil there occasionally. But it's brilliant. And, you know, I, I might have just had the most, most phenomenal two weeks we all have. Having John Cleese in the rehearsal room with you was a pure masterclass. We were so lucky. Yeah, I can imagine. And, 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 and sort of surreal. <laughs> the thought. Bizarre. I'm sat next to John Cleese, who I've watched for years and years and years in, in Python and Salt Towers and all those things, clockwise with a big film, A Fish Called Wanda. Um, you know, and he's chatting to me like, you know, do a bit over there and that bit over there. Yeah. That was funny. What do you think of that bit? Ask me. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it, it, was, it was bizarre. Yeah. So, uh, do you still get the, those kind of pinch yourself moments? Because you'd have thought when you've been in the business, uh, you know, as long as you have, you, you, you kind of get become a bit blasé about it, but obviously not. Uh, never, absolutely never. As people who you admire and you respect, uh, well, true story, last May, Patricia Routledge, who is one of my all-time comedy heroes, yeah. you know, I just, I just adore her, everything she's done. But because she started out in musicals as well and then moved into comedy, she was doing um, a, a, a chat, an afternoon with, at the Theatre Hall Haymarket with um, a, a gentleman who was interviewing her, and I've managed to get tickets, I was on the third row. And I wrote her a little card, which I've never done to anybody before in my life, and I posted it into stage door. Um, just saying how much of an influence she was and how much I admired her and her work and thank you so much for all the years of, of entertainment. Um, and I waited at stage door for half an hour just to say hello. Yeah. So, you know, I never, and I was just thrilled just to have said hello. You wouldn't dare ask for a picture because that's not done within that, you know, for a lady of her age or whatever, you don't say, oh, can I have a selfie? No. <laughs> just to actually meet her and say hello and thank you. Oh my goodness! It made you know. It made my year. Well, I, I mean, I, similarly for me, I mean, I I was always a, a big status quo fan as a as a kid. Oh, uh, yeah. Up, up until well, this until this day, and uh, and last year I, I I interviewed Francis Rossi twice, and right. uh, and I just I, every, every time I was kind of going, am I doing this? Is this happening? <laughs> yeah, just... I sang with them on Corrie because they were at my wedding. Absolutely, yeah. I forgot yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, not many people can say that. Yeah, brilliant. And yeah. to be involved in something as iconic as Coronation Street, for most actors, I mean, it, it's it, it's a dream. And I, I, I read that you were just about to, to, to pack the acting in. Is that true? Pretty much, yeah. I'd had my daughter and I'd done a few episodes of Bad Girls uh, and then nothing really came in for about 18 months, which in hindsight now was perfect because it, it was meant to be. I was at home with Gracie and looking after her and my husband was off working. But um, I thought, you know what, I'm going to try and change agents and I'm going to give it one last shot. I'd started teaching children's music classes, doing, you know, um, nursery rhymes and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I changed agents and um, and I, I still today say it's purely because my photo and CV landed on the desk at the right time uh, at Granada um, uh, with my curly hair or whatever. They were looking for Sizzy's mum. And uh, six weeks later, I got an audition, then a screen test and got the part. Incredibly. So quite easily, if not, if I had to change the agent, I would have got an audition and got the part. And it, when, when you, st- how, how does it work sort of logistically? Uh, you're not, I mean, you're not contracted for four years, are you? But is it like... No, you start off with six months and then each, they reassess and then it goes to a year and then it's a year contract. But that, that must be amazing to get a six month contract on Coronation Street. It just... Oh, it was, yeah. I mean, when my, my agent called me on a Monday tea time and I still remember it, I was, we got back my husband and I had gone, we'd, neither of us had got a job, and we were doing, well, how the hell are we going to pay the mortgage? What are we going to do? Yeah. We went, went to South End, we made some chicken sandwiches, and we went to South End with our daughter, and we sat on the beach at South End, both going, oh. We got back, and it was about 10 to 6. You know, just when the office hours are coming to a close, and you think, well, I'm not going to end today, and the phone went, and my agent went, you're sitting down. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Oh. But it was amazing, yeah. Fantastic. What a feeling. And those feelings kind of, do, do they come around often? lovely feeling when you get offered something just the fact that somebody likes you yeah 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 <laughs> it's good enough yeah um, 
but I think not for something, uh, not as much for something that was so life changing, you know, career wise, really, profile wise. So no, absolutely not. You know, I mean, I'd still be, I, I, I know, hopefully, I'd still be working, I'd still be doing stuff, but I certainly wouldn't be doing some of the stuff if I hadn't been hand done on Coronation Street. Possibly not even doing Bang Bang that I'm touring with at the moment. You don't know. No. You know, because um, I, I, you know, we're there. The three of us are there for our profiles, but to bring different. Um, range of audience in. And it's, uh, yeah, I suppose it does open doors, doesn't it? But, um, I mean, a, fr- a friend of mine's just done 18 episodes on it. It's played the social worker for, I don't know if you watch it still. Um, no, not really. Uh, well, Fizz and his, and Fizz's daughter's got into some sort of mess. My messing. granddaughter. Yeah. Oh, right. Who is Fizz? This is my daughter. Oh, it's your daughter, right? All right, so your granddaughter, yes. Who is it? There's a, there's, there's some kerfuffle. Going on. I'll be honest with you, I hadn't watched it for ages. I only watched it because my friend was on it. Um, oh. And uh, yeah, but I was talking to her, and she said going in on your first day is so surreal and bizarre. Was it? Can you remember going in on your first day? And absolutely, yeah. My first day. Luckily, I wasn't filming. I'd gone in for a costume fitting. We'd gone shopping for stuff. Uh, and I sat in the sofa in the green room next to um, Bill Roach and Eileen Derbyshire, Ken oh. and Emily, and I just thought, this is bizarre, this is really <laughs> odd. Oh, goodness, I don't have to film anything today because I just wanted to take it all in first. And then two days later, I had eight scenes to do, so it really wasn't back to the back to the fire anyway. But yeah. the first day, luckily, just going in and saying hello. And they're all so friendly, and I think that makes it a great team because you you, you know, you t- take the lead, don't you? If, some, if when you arrive... Somebody is so lovely to you and shows you everywhere and no matter who you are, you do the same when new people come in. Yeah. And does it very quickly become a job or...? Um, well, you know, yeah, any job's a job, really. I mean, uh, uh, we're just lucky in this respect, I suppose, within the acting profession, we love what we do as a job. But, it, yeah, it does become a routine. Um, and I had to drive, you know, li- from London to Manchester and stay in Manchester and be away from home and all that kind of stuff. So... So I decided after four years that I wanted to go out and do other things and, and have a bit more time at home, scheduled. So, um, so yeah, it was time to move on for me. But the, the the bizarre thing about something like that is, I mean, one day you're just a normal person and the next day you're a, you're, you're a celebrity. Did you sort of fit into that kind of, into those shoes easily? Well, uh, the, the joy for me was I was slightly older. You know, I was in my mid to late 30s, so nobody was really interested in me. I had a family. I don't, you know, I was married with a, with a, a child and... So I wasn't going out partying, um, so it didn't really affect me. I, I'm not a huge, huge, you know, sort of um, big do party person. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I don't really put myself out there uh, unless it's going to theatre or things like that. But that, that the, the characters of, of yourself, Silla and um, and the Les Battersby, you were almost like the comic relief. Um, is that is that is that how it started, or did the writers kind of write to your strength after a while? Yeah, that's sort of what they do, because she was, she was rather nasty when she first came in. She took Reese to court and was quite vile. Uh-huh. And then suddenly I think they saw that a bit of a comic influence in there from me, and um, and they started writing more the comedy. So it was sort of my fault, my own fault, really, that she got a little bit too much at times. Yeah. <laughs> Hence the status quo story, which was <laughs> very odd. <laughs> yeah, very odd. Wow. What, uh, I, uh, I, can you imagine? As a, as a status quo fan, I was thinking, what's this? But um, yeah, but I mean, as, as it's, uh, I mean, playing comedy it, on Bang Bang now is yeah. it, people people wouldn't be that shocked by that because they've seen well, you do no, what you do. I don't think so. No, she, I mean, she is she is uh, again a, well, fast is rather over the top. I say a countess who unfortunately has had an affair with a lion tamer who was below her class, and the count decided that wasn't on. He didn't mind her having affairs, but not with somebody below their class. So he divorced her, and she's now having to work as a concierge. So she oversees the rooms in Paris where all the, the, the um, illicit things are going on, um, and is quite nosy neighbour. So she's good fun. She's good fun. But I do have a song, because Farce is always in three acts, and we put act one and act two together just to give us two. So to cover the scene change between one and two, John Cleese and a wonderful musician called John Chambers have written me a song. So I do a little song about the Lion Tamer story and what happened in this affair, while everybody else is behind me shifting the scenery. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, and it works really, really well, because all of a sudden, without knowing it, you're in a completely different apartment. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, it, it is very good fun, really good fun. It's definitely, you know, if you want to come to the theatre and laugh for two and a half hours, you will, I promise. Brilliant. I really look forward to seeing it, actually. Closes on right. Saturday, in, Saturday, doesn't it, in uh, Mould? Yeah.
It's lovely there. The space is great, yeah. Fantastic. Wendy, it's been a treat to speak to you. Thanks ever so much for that. It's a pleasure, Andy. No worries, no worries at all. I hope you enjoy it. Lovely. Thanks ever so much. Take care of yourself. Take care. Cheers. If you want to go to the theatre and laugh for two and a half hours, who doesn't want to do that? There you go. There, Tessa Pete Jones, Tony Gardner and the brilliant Wendy Peters, who was uh, starring in this brand new piece by John Cleese. John Cleese making his stage debut, a writing debut, uh, with this hilarious new adaptation of this classic comedy. It's called Bang Bang and it closes actually in Theatre Clue tonight before going all over the UK. Uh, if you want to get uh, tickets uh, for this evening or this afternoon, there's a matinee this afternoon, 2.30. If you want to go to that, you better get your clogs on. 01352, this is the box office number. 01352 344101. 01352 344101. Wonderful. Three wonderful guests on the stage and screen show. Absolutely brilliant. Go on, support your local theatres, girls and boys. They will not be there forever if you don't.